Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking you, to you today, the Camaragal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Kelly Mitchell from the Historical Services team at Stanton Library. And today I have the pleasure of introducing North Sydney Council's historian, Dr. Ian Hoskins, for the fourth in our online history talk series, A Sober Industrious Store Abiding People, Chinese Market Gardeners and Shopkeepers in North Sydney from 1870 to 1932. We intend to continue this series this year, so please keep an eye on our website for um, further details. And if you missed any of the previous talks, recordings are available to watch online. Just search the website for History Talks to find the links. And if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to write them into the chat box and I'll put them to Ian for a short Q&A session after his presentation. Um, but for any other general inquiries, um, requests for images and so on, then please email localhistory at northsydney.nsw.gov.au. Um, and now I'll hand over to Ian for his presentation. If you'd like to start sharing your screen, Ian. I will. Thank you, Kelly. I will turn myself off. And I hope this pops up as a full screen in a moment. There we are. Is that okay, Kelly? Okay. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for for logging on and and coming along. More than forty people. I. I recognize some of the names and um, should say hello to Dawn Wong, uh, who, whose family I'll mention in a moment. So thanks very much for coming, Dawn, I appreciate that. Um, and th this, this is a, a topic that's long interested me. My, my um, previous incarnation before I came to North Sydney in 2003 was as a curator at the Powerhouse Museum. And the last project I worked on there uh, was uh, an exhibition about a family of um, property owners and, and storekeepers uh, in the Bolong area, which is not far from Crookwell, which is not far from Goulburn, that general area. And, and there were the Wong family. Um, and Wong Sat, who you can see there on the left, married Amelia Wong, who's in on the left of the photograph in the middle. And together they ran a, a sheep property, which you can see on the on the um, far right. And more importantly for the exhibition I was doing, they, they ran a local store and that's that building there. And remarkably enough that the, the store survived in that very dry environment, survived and it's still there standing. I had the absolute um, honor and pleasure of, of driving down there and seeing it. The, the collection remained um, in that store and through the, 1920s, the store was closed up in, in 1920, sorry, and through the, 19, the 20th century and came in parts of the Powerhouse Museum through the um, 1980s and 90s. And that's the collection I worked on. So as Chinese Australian history was top of mind when I, um, when I came to council in, in 2003, as I said, and as I began looking through the council ledgers and the archives um, with, with Chinese people top of mind, I began noticing references to local Chinese people. And, and here's an example of that one that caught my eye early on. Um, you can see that little snippet from one of our ledger books, what we call rate and valuation books, which were the, the, um, the books that council clerks kept that record uh, properties, property owners, uh, those who are leasing properties and the rates that needed to be paid on those properties, um, which were calculated in relation to the value of the property itself. That they are a huge uh, storehouse of information for us in, in historical services. And there you can see in the middle of that uh, page, Alan Lowe, shopkeeper. And this is a, an entry for Walker Street, in fact, for the property 100 Walker Street. And you can see in brackets, Chinese. Um, and at, that caught my eye, you know, why, why the need to refer to him as Chinese? Well, of course, we're talking about Australia in the 1920s and Australia in the 1920s is white Australia. 
um, Australia was white Australia right through to the 60s and finally done away with in um, 73. Uh, so monitoring who was an alien uh, and the Chinese were regarded as aliens was important. Now, I don't quite know why it was important for council and why that Clark wrote Chinese next to Alan's name. Clearly the name didn't indicate that he was um, Chinese, but as I'll show you later, the, the name that was on his immigration documents was Lin Lo. So Alan Lo clearly anglicized his name. Um, and there's a photograph of him, which is supplied very serendipitously by someone I met at a conference not long after starting at, at North Sydney Council. He said he was a relation of mine. The chances of that are just extraordinarily small. But anyway, he, he sent that photograph over of, of Alan looking very respectable in his wing collar and tie. Um, and he was running a shop in Walker Street. So I knew I was onto something and, and it was a project that was, has been a long time in gestating and then realizing, I'll talk about where we're going with it at the end of um, this hour. Um, we also have in the collection, just a few items. Um, the, the, it's, it's mainly archival information that I've got to work with here unlike at the powerhouse where the, the collection is extraordinarily rich. Um, but this was something that had turned up before my time, found uh, in a house in Neutral Bay, and that is a teapot and the basket is a beautifully woven basket that is padded on the inside with straw and a, a cloth lining. And it's there to keep um, tea warm, presumably when you're out working in a field. So it's a classic sort of market gardener's um, kit. I'm just estimating the dates of those. I have no idea about the provenance of that, its story, but it so wonderfully illustrates um, what Chinese people have been using in gardens and presumably in a, in a store if you're standing up all day too, keeping your tea warm. Um, we, we do have uh, archival records such as the Rate and Ledger books that I mentioned, but some photographs, very few photographs of Chinese properties. In fact, only one specific photograph of a Chinese property, which I'll show you. But when you look at the rate and valuation books and you work out where, where the Chinese were gardening and where they were shopkeeping, you can then look at photographs and know that um, various shops were occupied by um, Chinese people at a particular time. And that road on the right of that photograph is uh, the Pacific Highway today. Um, I think I, yes, you can see my cursor, I hope. Uh, so the Pacific Highway there at the time called Lane Cove Road. This is Berry Street, if you can imagine that. And that's the grounds of Marsalu that becomes Monte San Angelo to orientate you. And there is Miller Street running down here. Well, a great many of these shops here were run at various times by Chinese people, mainly residential on the west side of Lane Cove Road, but commercial on the east side lots of Chinese people here. Some facts and figures. So I'll, I'll talk mainly about the context in the first half of the of the talk this afternoon, and then I'll get into some specifics, some um, details about where people were and what they were doing and putting some names to faces and vice versa. So in 1891, as far as I can work out, having looked at the, the various census and counting things up um, using council archives, there were 70 Chinese people, or people of Chinese, heritage in North Sydney. By 1921, there are 250, still a very small proportion when compared to the overall population, but it's grown significantly. And then 20 years later or so, 25 years later, it's dropped way back to just 20 people, again, using the census for those records. So um, I'm not sure how necessarily accurate they are. Some people may not identify as Chinese in any of those census accounts, but that, that's the records we have to go on. Um, I suspect the the change between 1921 and 47 reflects the um, centralization or the, the growth of Chinatown or the establishment and consolidation of Chinatown in the Haymarket area. The Chinese had been there for a long time. There was a community there and even earlier down at the rocks um, on, the, on the south side of the harbour that is in the city of Sydney. Um, but Chinatown is a name that's um, applied to the Haymarket area from the 1920s. And it seems to me an interesting coincidence at any rate that the, the 
population peaks in North Sydney in the 20s and then falls away very quickly in the 30s and, and 40s. There's that stretch of road today. Um, there's absolutely nothing left of that part of the Pacific Highway, former Lane Code Road. There are a couple of shop fronts. I don't have photographs of you of them for you today. Just up near the um, the intersection with West Street, that are uh, early 20th century shop fronts. So they do date from the Chinese commercial era. I should get photographs of those. I I'm not aware that Chinese people operated those shops, but they they're the last surviving bit of old old Lane Cove. So. Having said that there were only 20 people in 1947, in 2016, the last um, census that we have details for for North Sydney, there are just under 6,000 people of Chinese heritage, again, out of a population of 73,000, so not huge, but that represents the third largest group of those born out of side of Australia in the local area. And the largest is from the UK, the second largest from New Zealand. And Mandarin and Cantonese are the second and third most common languages spoken at home after English. So they are a substantial part of our local community today. And, and the, the value of doing this project then is to establish a history and a heritage um, for the local Chinese population. They may not be related to those people who lived here in the late 19th and early 20th century, but uh, I would like to show that there were those from China who came before um, and made a huge contribution to the local area. For, the, for although those numbers were small, uh, 250 people in 1921, the, their occupations being mainly retailers in the 1920s, but also market gardeners, made, meant that they were very, um, very visible and very important. If you can recall your own experience from going to shops rather than supermarkets, if, uh, say, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, your interactions are with a, a shopkeeper and you establish a relationship with that person. Um, and 250 people spread across North Sydney really is quite significant because they were the people who were interacting with local communities and selling them produce. Uh, and they are literally all over the all over the community, although I'll show you where they were concentrated as we as we move on. All right, so a bit of the setting of the Chinese in Sydney and then North Sydney. Um, th there's, there's a Chinese connection with uh, European Australia from the get-go, probably with Aboriginal Australia um, via the Trepang uh, trade at the top end and the Macassans and Trepang so on sold to China much earlier than that. But after the Europeans arrived in 1788, there is a colonial trade between here and China, um, seal skins, sandalwood, is being sought in the Pacific and on sold into China, and colonial Australians are buying tea and ceramics. Um, 1823, first Anglo-Chinese family in the colony that I've found anyway. Uh, the Opium War and Treaty of Nanjing in 1840. Um, not interestingly, when I've looked at the the accounts of um, those conflicts with the British, you know, a bit of a dark part of, of British history, more than a bit, very dark. Um, the colonial accounts aren't entirely um, supportive of, of British actions in, in China, which is interesting. Um, there are Chinese men coming to work in New South Wales, a term used at the time as coolies. Uh, but the big, the big change, of course, is with the discovery of gold in 1851. And in New South Wales and, and Queensland are the first rushes, and then there's other rushes in, in Queensland in the 1870s. And so the figures really do start to, to rise very dramatically. Um, nearly 13,000 people in Chinese men, that is, and only two women um, in 1861. And that prompts concerns on the part of authorities, not, not so much based on race, specifically race as it becomes defined later in the 19th century, but because of the disorder on the, the gold fields. And that disorder is related to race and is related to being different because um, European gold diggers treat Chinese people terribly badly. They see them as competitors and very efficient competitors at that. They, they live very frugally, work very hard, pick over the tailings from old European mines and often come up with 
things that had been missed, which causes resentment. So the, the conflicts are, are physical, there's, there's violence, literally violence, but there's a lot of abuse. You, it's, it can be very um, upsetting reading newspaper accounts uh, and even newspaper editorials at the time blaming Chinese people for violence and, and bad behavior, where in fact they were the victims of that. That said, um, having done a bit of research on this very recently for, a, for another project I worked on outside of Council, the, the History of Australia and the Pacific, which looked at China as part of the Pacific, I was taken by the number of sympathetic accounts and supportive accounts, particularly in the earlier period, by white newspapers such as the Empire, um, supportive of Chinese and, and condemning of, of racism and violence. So that was interesting too. So there's, there's restriction brought in in 1861. And then once the numbers fall away um, in 1867, that act is repealed. Um, now it's introduced again in 1881 and we, we're starting to see the rise of a, a, a biological sense of, of race. You know, the, these people, the Chinese are very different and they will always be different. Biology is related at that point um, to culture. And in 1881, there is another Restriction Act passed and there's still only 10,000 people, Chinese people in New South Wales, but their presence is seen to be disruptive and unsettling. The idea is that New South Wales and all the Australian colonies are for white people, white men as the term was used. And that is the banner of the one of the most popular journals of the time, um, the Bulletin, literally. So Australia is being defined um, by colour. Uh, it is for Europeans and it is part of the British Empire very specifically. 1888, um, there is yet another act and, and um, more restriction. Uh, the Chinese population has gone up despite that 1881 um, Restriction Act, um, but they're only representing 1.2% of the population. And the restriction comes in because um, captains of ships are charged taxes 100 pounds a head, which is extraordinary which are then on, um, passed on to, to immigrants, some of who, whom are coming out under their own um, funds, but they have to borrow money or they're being um, sponsored. Uh, just what people do to get out here at that time is extraordinary. Some of them are smuggled out as well and found in the holds of ships and in refrigeration areas of ships in the 1880s. I've read accounts of those at near death once they um, dock. So that's the scene on the on the right. That picture is um, 1886. That's the uh, east side of Circular Quay. Well, Henry Parks was one of the um, most vehement of those in power at the time uh, who were vehemently opposed Chinese immigration. As the Premier of New South Wales, he had a great sway and he sponsored those um, restriction acts in 1881 and 1888. He's also, in relevance to, to my project, was the member for St. Leonard's. St. Leonard's was the name for the area that is now known essentially today as North Sydney. So he was the parliamentary member. And in 1888, I discovered a, a lecture he gave down in Walker Street, the building called Centennial Hall is no longer there, unfortunately, but it was a very, very long lecture right, leading up to a, an election later in the year. Um, covered many areas but he he spent a lot of time talking about the Chinese um, and the, the crowd was very supportive and cheering and laughing and carrying on um, and what was interesting is that he referred to them as sober industrious law-abiding people and hence the the name of the talk this afternoon however <laughs> despite all those things which um, the adjectives that couldn't be applied to a lot of other people who are of European origin um, he regarded them as being uh, incompatible with, with European Australians. So that they came amongst us without any power of sympathizing in any of our pursuits. Aliens to our pursuits as a free people, so they didn't have a sense of democracy, I, I'm guessing he's saying. It was a sacred obligation on every citizen to preserve the British type in the nation we are seeking to found here. So the two types of people um, are, are incompatible. And it's just extraordinary having um, describe them as sober, industrious and law-abiding, why you wouldn't want them among you. Um, it's because <laughs> for all those other reasons, which are typically 
a little less um, uh, well defined. Goodness. And we're just looking at racism, you know, a fear of the other, a fear of difference, and a willingness to exploit that difference and to vilify the other, particularly when those people are competing very effectively as gardeners and, and shopkeepers. So when you, so there's Henry Parks at the top of the, the political tree, if you like, as the, as the premier, speaking like that, he, he wasn't being overtly um, abusive in this talk, but there are many other journals, and, and you can read the bulletin as, as an example, where the cartoons and the language is, is really, really racist. There's no other word for it. It's really unpleasant. Um, so here's, here's Walker Street with the Centennial Hall, I think is just to the south of this postcard. Um, but this is the town a little after Henry Parks had died, a decade after he'd died, but the town that he would have known, they're all Victorian shop fronts there. Um, the, the Immigration Restriction Act, what we know as the White Australia Policy, or one part of that, was introduced in 1901 and, and really defines this new nation, the Commonwealth of Australia. And that is a direct relation to the Restriction Acts that Parks and others in other colonies had um, brought in. In 1904, a little less well known is the Commonwealth Naturalisation Act, which was you know, another pillar of White Australia, um, as was a, an act which expelled um, South Pacific Islanders who had helped establish the sugar industry in Australia and Queensland. Um, and, and the Commonwealth Naturalisation Act made it impossible for Chinese people and others from Africa and elsewhere to become naturalised. Quite a number of Chinese people had already become naturalised in the 1870s, remarkably, given the, the um, antipathy towards them. Um, and, and here are some figures just to again, to provide a bit of context. So despite being sort of regarded as a, an outback country in the 19th century, um, the importance of the bush had already been established in, in poetry and, and stories, only 17% of men overall in New South Wales were employed in agriculture. Um, so a, a large part of Australians were living in large towns and cities. Um, whereas 37% of Chinese men in New South Wales were employed in, in gardening and farming and 13% were selling fruit and vegetables and produce. So um, uh, produce, uh, vegetables and, and fruit were a large part of the way Chinese people were making their income in New South Wales. Um, now, these people were either those who came after the, the gold rushes or they had left the gold fields in the 1860s or 70s and taken up pursuits as market gardeners um, thereabouts and, and moved to towns to pursue that. Um, there are also quite a lot of furniture makers, but I haven't found reference to furniture makers in North Sydney, but th that's the case around the rocks area. So in 1840 in New South Wales, there were twice as many men as there were women. Um, that has almost halved by 1900 but the Chinese population is predominantly men and because they were coming over largely as either married men leaving their families behind or single men um, coming over to make money uh, either by finding gold in the first instance or, or through um, uh, commerce or whatever they had chosen to do after that uh, and sending that money back. The term that's applied to those people is sojourners, which means they hadn't intended to stay. They're here for a while and they will return to the ch to China um, with with gold, but they're sending money back um, in the meantime. Uh, now a lot of them do stay on; they they do become permanent, but they're also going back and forth, um, fulfilling obligations to family. And a lot of the immigration records that survive in the National Archives uh, illustrate that people are going back and forth, and therefore they have to fill out endless forms in order to be allowed back into white Australia, particularly after 1901. I'll talk more about those forms in a, in a moment. Um, it, it's a, it, it's the, the Australian colonies uh, and European Australians are very literate in the late 19th century and newspapers and journals are very important. I've mentioned the bulletin and it's important for spreading really horrible anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, but there are many other papers, many of them illustrated the Sydney Mail that you can see a, a, a poster therefore is one of those illustrated papers. 
they're spread all over the colony, reporting on all manner of things, really high quality illustrations. Well, the local Chinese community is also well read and well represented um, with their own newspapers, uh, some of which are available online. And there's a, there's a list of those. The earliest, I think, yeah, 1898 with the Tanghua Times, with Tanghua News, sorry. Um, so that's very interesting. The, this is a literate population by the end of the 19th century. Um, and there are people, there are journalists who are reporting on the, the issues that uh, interest the local Chinese population in China and locally. They are also people, predominantly men, as I said, who are carrying on cultural activities and religious activities. So this photograph is from the um, Yuming Temple um, in Alexandria, which, which uh, had been restored in part by conservators from the Powerhouse Museum when I was there. So I was, I was aware of this and the Powerhouse published a book on the Yuming Temple. Um, but there was also the Si Yuk Temple at Glebe, which is still there as well tucked away down towards the water. Um, the, the population in New South Wales, the general population, European population for the most part is overwhelmingly Christian, unsurprisingly, very few people um, uh, identify as atheist. Uh, and so there's 1.3 million Christians and that's almost the whole of the population of New South Wales. And there's only um, five, five and a half thousand Buddhists and Confucians I, I haven't found any reference to uh, religious buildings uh, relating to, to either Buddhism or Confucian beliefs in North Sydney. There are nine churches in North Sydney by 1901, so there's, there's a lot of Christian activity going on. And, but I'm wondering whether um, some of that activity might have happened on the market gardens or in, or in shops. I, I don't know. And quite possibly the, from 1904 or 1910, people were travelling to the south to go to those two temples that I've got listed there. These are extraordinary photographs from um, the showground, what is we would call the showground today, um, where there are any number of parades and sporting pictures and things going on in the late 19th century. And this is part of the um, Jubilee celebration for Queen Victoria in 1897. And here's the local Chinese community rolling up, despite all the vilification and antipathy by people like Henry Parks and the, the editors of the, the bulletin, here they are parading themselves very proudly you know, with their instruments and dressed up in traditional gear there on horses. I just find that astonishing. I have a feeling that that photograph at the top with the chap on the horse and the other man dressed as warriors I'm, I'm taking, um, looking closely at the people behind who are dressed in European um, costume coats and bowlers and umbrellas. I'm trying to look, when I look closely at the faces, they look Chinese to me. So they are performing, parading for each other. And that's very interesting. It says something about their, their confidence and the numbers that are here. There, were, there was a um, critical number that allowed for this. It's, it's astonishing. I do know also, having worked at the Powerhouse Museum, that there were uh, Chinese instruments and all sorts of cultural implements that could be bought in Chinatown because um, the first curator there, uh, Joseph Henry Maiden, bought them, bought uh, examples of, of Chinese musical instruments, uh, opium pipes and other things in Chinatown and put them into the powerhouse, what was called the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, as it still is, um, used to be the powerhouse when I was there. Uh, those, those items are still in the collection I should mention also that the, the exhibition that I did way back then in 2002 is still on display. I'm, I'm really proud of that. It's still there. You can go and see a history of the, the Wong family and see some of those um, objects that were bought for the museum uh, back in the late 19th century. I have, I put those on display um, 20 years ago and they're still on display. So how about that? Anyway, um, 1897, there's the parade, 1908. Um, a thousand men, women and children, and some of those women I suspect could have been Anglo because Chinese men, quite a few of them married uh, into the European community uh, and had children. Uh, they gathered for a picnic and fireworks and dragons and things at, at Clifton Gardens. How about that? This is one of the most extraordinary books that have survived and a, and a great reference for me. 
um, son Johnson, who came out, I think, in the 1870s, uh, he writes a book called The Self-Educator, which is full of Chinese English phrases specifically for the Chinese commercial community. He wrote it in the 1890s. This copy survives at the State Library of New South Wales. It, um, all the photographs I'm showing you today are either from our collection or if I've sourced the State Library of New South Wales or elsewhere, um, that'll be indicated, but I forgot to do that in this instance. So this is from the State Library of New South Wales. Um, and just look at these entries. No, madam, I'm sorry I cannot. They cost me more than that. I paid 10 pence a dozen for them. Besides the labor of carrying them around, the profit is, profit is very small. All of these phrases suggest to me a lot of haggling and bartering is going on between the vendor who may actually be a hawker carrying baskets of produce around, or he may be someone with a shop, a shop front, having to argue back and forth uh, with the customer. And I suspect that was the case uh, with Chinese people far more than with Europeans. You know, there's a sense that I will barter the Chinese man down because I'm better than him. Uh, I'll see what I can get from him. So all these polite deferential attempts to offset that um, driving down of the, the price of oranges or apples or whatever they're, they're um, talking about. I went through that uh, uh, self-educated to find references to produce and these are all the things that I found. There were at least 35 varieties of fruit and vegetables uh, that were referenced in that book so I assume that's what's being sold and grown um, and some of those are there grapes, oranges, mangoes, pomegranates, spring onions, cauliflowers, carrots and cold war. Uh, bearing in mind that the European Australian diet wasn't all that adventurous, it was still very English in Australia. Um, but I have come across reference to the Chinese Australian diet being very Chinese still, you know, they cook their own foods and they were often importing um, condiments and, and other produce from China. So they, 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 they weren't um, eating a lot of, of local fare fresh fare, but not the, not the stuff that makes Chinese food so special. And um, there's a photograph unidentified that I'm not sure where this place was, but it looks like a, an urban center of some sort of a Chinese gardener or hawker. And a brilliant description of um, such a man um, or men from Edgar Wright, uh, who wrote up his memories of North Sydney. He was here at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, he wrote them up in the 1960s and thanks to the North Shore Historical Society, they survived and were published in their journal. And therefore we have a copy. And, and there is this wonderful description of his memories as a, a boy or a young man, a, a quiet, inoffensive lot working from dawn till dark, you know, of course with um, Henry Parks' account, seven days a week. They carried their quite excellent vegetables in baskets slung across shoulders. Look how heavy those baskets are. That must've been some some job to have to do that and how your shoulders would ache. Um, and they'd go from door to door. They carried these baskets for miles, shuffling along with a particular peculiar gait that kept the basket steady. Wow, you know, they worked terribly hard doing that. There's a man crossing um, the footbridge in Darling Harbour. A couple of others, probably on the south side, Arthur Sire took photographs, spontaneous photographs with a little hidden camera the turn of the century and we've got these wonderful records there probably on the south side as well but this is the one that i particularly like there is a hawker um selling his wear to two european women in a terrace house that could be on the south side or it could be on the north side and again edgar wright has a, a description there at christmas there was always a jar of ginger and a bag of lychee nuts for the housewives offered with a friendly grin and a ceremonial bow which suggests that there was a good relationship at least in Edgar Wright's observation between um, the Chinese men and the, the women who were buying for the, for the family. I say that that might even be the north side, so, so our area, because Arthur Sire came to the north side, and we know that from this photograph, North Shore Steam Ferry Company, that's Milson's Point. So he, he came over here, and that's Lavender Bay. So their evidence that some of those photographs may be of Chinese men in North Sydney. I'm wondering whether this is a photograph of a Chinese man in Camaray, because there's not much evidence of Sai going um, really far south of Sydney in the rural areas, but it wouldn't have taken uh, too long to hop on a ferry and then head up Miller Street by tram and then continue on to the market gardens at Camaray. Uh, 
which were there in the um, turn of the century. Now, so sources, and we'll get down to specifics. Um, it's it's hard. It's hard to find details about specific people using uh, the national archives because often names are just referred to. Uh, people are referred to by names R Ping. R is like an honorific, a bit bit like Mister, I suppose. And so that's Mister Ping. We don't know his first name. There are R Pings in the valuation rate books that I've been looking at, but I really have no idea um, in this case whether that's our R Ping or another R Ping. Um, sometimes these immigration documents uh, will refer to where the person resides. And in this case, there wasn't that information. So I'm left to wonder whether this, uh, it's quite unlikely that he's the R Ping that I've discovered up uh, in a garden at Camaray. However, I've recorded this. What's also interesting is that these records nonetheless exist. And so we have photographs to attach to names and palm prints are used. This is even before fingerprinting or at the time fingerprinting is used to identify criminals, palm prints are used to surveil this unwanted population in, in Australia. It's just astonishing. And this is the precursor to the modern passport as well. So when Chinese men are in New South Wales and they're needing to return to China to pay their respects for a few months to family, re-establish links, and then come back again. They have to jump through all sorts of administrative bureaucratic hoops, get uh, people who vouch for their respectability, and they need to have their photograph taken from the side and the front and their palm print so they can't be mistaken for anyone else because the European authorities, the white Australian authorities, don't want to be um, letting more Chinese people in than are already here. I suppose it's interesting in itself that they're, they're allowed to return at all, but they had established businesses and it would have been chaotic um, had they just been excluded from the country once they returned to China. That much can be said. So there's our ping, as I said. Here's the, and here are the details of the man that I found um, uh, locally operating well, actually, he originally operated a store, not a garden, but then he had a share in a garden in 1903. Here's another example of that, R. Pau. I don't, there is an R. Pau up at Camaray, um, but I don't know whether this is that man. And there, there would be many R. Pau's in the National Archives, I, I know that. But I was lucky enough, successful in some instances, and here is Sam Hicks with an anglicized name, and I discovered from the other documents that survived with these photographs in the handprint that he is the Sam Hicks, the greengrocer of Blues Point Road, who I know to be of Chinese origin. So there is a photograph of one of our local Chinese men, and there's his palm print. And also there is Chong Chu, who on his documents has said he's from Waterfall, North Sydney, which means the Willoughby Falls in Camaray. And the Willoughby Falls were fed by a creek and that creek provided water for the market gardens up at Camaray. And there is Lynn Lowe, Alan Lowe. So there, there's what our documents here at council can provide in conjunction with um, the National Archives. And also we have maps and um, other directories, address directories, which allow us to place people in the landscape. So there is a map from 1887 and using the rate and valuation books, um, I've established that in those large blocks of land there, particularly the one by George Allen Bell that you can see in the middle, uh, there were Chinese market gardeners. So George Allen Bell didn't have a house on there. He just owned that land and he leased the land to the market gardeners. And you can see the creek running down to Willoughby Falls Creek. So there are the falls. Um, that were referred to by um, Chong Chu when he said, where did he come from? He came from Willoughby Falls and he's market gardening around that creek. And there is a list of all the people I've found in the rate and valuation books. Um, I, was, I was really excited when I first started to discover that and even more excited when I was just started to plot it out uh, and work out where they were. So Camaray Road is that road here. This is Camaray Road. So we've got Camaray Road there. Um, 
this is, oh, where are we? That's Young Street. So there we've got a reference to Young Street there. So there are market gardens around here too. We know that. Um, and that's Waringa Road there. So we know there are market gardens there. Even more, this area is called Long Bay before it becomes Middle Harbour. And North Bridge and the big bridge is over here to orientate you. So that, this is the main time for market gardeners, the late 19th century up until the early 20th century. And I'll show you why, because in 1907, all this land here is subdivided for housing. And there's one of the first subdivision plans. Um, and here's a, a, uh, an entry in the Australian Star, which was a pretty racist newspaper at the time. But what are the Chinese gardens to the right and left of the creek to Willoughby Falls, which I've just shown you on the maps? Are they destined to remain there in perpetuity? Surely if this is North Sydney, were what she is destined to be, they'd be possible to resume these gardens. To resume is to, to take them back and turn them into housing. And that's exactly what happened. So you can go up there today to Bellevue Street. You can see houses that were clearly built in the first decade of the 20th century. And you know, looking back that um, behind them, that th th there is a creek there and, and these were once market gardens. But if you don't look at the maps, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a clue of that. Okay, so back on the Lane Cove Road, his, and what is now the Pacific Highway, look at this. Th this is a list of all the Chinese men that I plotted along there um, from, what's the earliest date, 1886 through to 1906, running along this line here, if you can see my cursor. Now, when you look at the details there, you realize that people are only staying for a few years in a, in a shop. There's um, one person being succeeded by another. Sometimes because of the clerks working for council are unfamiliar with Chinese names. Um, and I'm not sure whether the Chinese person is fronting up themselves to give their details to the clerk, or it's been given by the owner of the shop. Um, but you can be sure in some instances that the same name is being um, uh, written down in various forms. But in other cases, uh, they are definitely different people. So Ah Sing, I suspect, is different from Ah Ping, Ah He, Ah Sam, Ah On. But um, where are we? Sing Tak may well be Tak Sing. They may be the same person. This almost constitutes a little Chinatown, but it's spread over an area um, and it's spread over a, a decade or more. But that's a concentration of Chinese people. That's what that stretch of road looks like. There's no photograph of a store with a Chinese um, name on the top, unfortunately. There's Foley Brothers, but that's the what Lanco Road looks like at the time, and that east side, which is the commercial side. Um, there are people, Chinese people in Mount Street, um, and that's Mount Street at the time, and these people would be further up here. Unfortunately, I don't have a good photograph of that area, but that's the type of shop front, around, particularly around the 1920s. The um, tram service that area there. So I suspect Wing Li and Co is the same as Wing Yi and Ki Sing and Ki Sing. They're all the, these is, this is how the names are recorded in the directories, but I suspect they're all the same people. There's the corner of Mount Street. So Alan Low, Mew Low and Lin Low, all the same people is further, he's further, ooh, actually he's the other way. He's back towards, in fact, where we're standing looking at this photograph. And you can see at number 110, there's Joe Lee, Joe, C, Joe Lee Singh and Lee Yi. They may indeed be the same people. There's Alan Lo Lin's exemption test. So it, that allowed him to go back to China and re-enter Australia, looking really respectable and well-dressed. So the epitome of the sober, industrious and everything person that um, Henry Parks referred to. I'm not sure when he arrives. I couldn't get that information from this document. So I've got this indicating that he went back to China in 1908 and I've got 
council records indicating he was at Walker Street at that time. So if we move further up Lane Cove Road, Pacific Highway to Crow's Nest, there's Lane Cove Road, Pacific Highway. We have another concentration of Chinese shopkeepers. Um, Alexander Street is there today. That's called North Sydney Road and that's uh, Willoughby Road today. And look at all the concentration there, sort of running along this side particularly of Willoughby Road and the Lane Cove Road. I'll just let you digest that. Again, some repeated names, people moving backwards and forwards between properties, lots of connections between people, I suspect. Um, the Chinese community in Sydney is, is interconnected in so many ways to do with places of origin, to do with clans and families and affiliations and all sorts of things. Um, I'm, I'm barely getting my head around all that. And I don't have inf any information about how these people were were linked, but you've got to imagine that they they were, and presumably linked in many ways to people on the south side. <clears throat> what I don't have is a, a list of people on Military Road, but they they were operating on Military Road in the first two decades of the 20th century as well. So there's there's Willoughby Road at that time, and this is Lane Cove Road over here. <clears throat> More going right up until 1910. I think that's a repeat of that earlier slide, I hope it's not. And here is the one photograph we have of a Chinese shop front. This is A Xing Sing's shop front at 5 Willoughby Road. So thrilled when I found that in the collection as a postcard. How about that unsealed road? Wondering if that's a, one of his sons. That boy there looks of Chinese origin to me. I could be wrong. Arsing Grocer. There's a an ad for Arsing that I found in the Freeman's Journal. Tea wine and provision merchant. And here are some of the details of Arsing that I've gleaned from the rate and valuation books, all the places that he was operating. Earliest specific reference is 1883. Um, there may in fact be more than one uh, Singh in North Sydney, so it can be a bit confusing. Uh, I've also found reference in a newspaper account to an uh, Singh opening a shop here in 1879, in which case that makes it the earliest shop that I've discovered in North Sydney. His corner, which I'm pretty sure this refers to in Willoughby Road, is a place, it becomes a place that's well known to people. Arsing's Corner is referred to as such um, in newspapers. And it was a time keeping place for the North Sydney Bicycle Club open road race in 1897. And it was a polling, the polling place was identified as opposite Arsing store. So people know where Arsing store is. It is a place, it's well known. <coughs> and here's some of Arsing's family, lots of sons and some daughters born and wonderfully so there's that date 1879 wonderfully his first son is named willoughby after the area i mean what better evidence of someone who believes that they've set down roots in a in a place that is astonishing now i don't know about arsing's wife and willoughby's mother i've got using birth uh, birth records um, I've got Ah Gu, Ah Li, Ah Li, Ah Yi. Um, I'm hoping the family might be able to help me out a bit there. What seems to be the case is that they move sometime around 1909 from St. Leonard, so the North Sydney area, um, to what we know as Chinatown today, so Little Hay Street, and the boy Leonard dies in 1911. I hope to verify all that with the, with the family. Um, Arthur Kong is, again, one of these instances, I, I, I found an Arthur Kong in the, um, the National Archives with a North Sydney connection and surmised that he is in fact Ah Kong, the gardener from Camaray Road, in which case he came out as a 10 year old boy and made a life for himself, looking really respectable here as a shopkeeper with that beautiful collar and tie. And he lives here all the way through to the 1930s. He's found guilty of using counterweighing machine, which was unjust to the extent of one ounce. <clears throat> 
Um, <laughs> no, he, he wouldn't be the only one. Um, but he was also ripped off by Robert Howard, who obtained groceries by fraud. Now, this is a really poignant record here. He, he goes back to China twice, once in the 1920s, I guess to marry, and again in the 1930s. So his wife remains in China. He has a relationship at distance. Isn't that astonishing? And a visit in 1938, um, the Japanese have invaded, I think the year before. So China might have been in upheaval. And he returns, but not with his wife. So it leaves you wondering what the story is. Gilbert Yet Ting Khoi is a very well known member of the Sydney Chinese community. Um, and we do know a bit about him because a bit of, uh, uh, has been written about him. He's a member of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, but he also has a shop and house in Lane Cove Road. How about that? And there's him with his Mason's apron on. Um, so he has a North Sydney connection. And is more evidence as he's asking of, of a link between the north and the south side. And perhaps the wealthiest of all our local Chinese men is James Choi, who, who made his money in wool in Western New South Wales, arrives as a 16 year old, and then establishes property in the West and moves to Sydney and buys um, a house which unfortunately has been demolished uh, in Karela. Carilla Road at Cremorne, a very fashionable area in the early 19th century. So I suspect it was a, a handsome two-story villa, uh, probably English revival style, as most of them were. Um, and he lives there until he dies in 1938. He is very wealthy, uh, very active in the Chinese community, regarded as a philanthropist. Um, and he's called by the Molong Argus the uncrowned Chinese King of Australia. How about that? There's that interesting, um, some people are held up and clearly respected, but, but they can never be accepted within the dominant Anglo-Australian society. So they, they're, they're respectable and they meet all the requirements of respectability, but because they are of Chinese heritage, they're kept at arm's length. There's an extraordinary photograph of James with his Chinese wife, not an Anglo wife, in traditional um, attire, I think wedding attire, but I might be corrected on that. Um, she is a local social entity. She arranges various parties and get to, gets together at um, Carilla Road. I've discovered from the newspapers, goes on a, uh, or gives a party for T.E.B. Russell, who the name would suggest is a member of the Anglo-Australian community. Um, at the Carilla Road property before Russell goes off on her world tour on the ceramic. Um, James dies in 1838 and a memorial service is given for him at the local Anglican church. So that's interesting. That suggests a certain assimilation into the local community, but his remains are then taken to the Chinese Masonic temple in Mary Street on the south side where they lay in state for the Chinese community to pay their respects. And then he's buried at Rookwood. How about that? So these these photographs are not in our collection. Um, I need to double check where I source these from. I drag them off the internet, I suspect, which is why the quality is not great, but um, I will source those a little better. So present day, there, there, there is a vibrant Chinese community, as I indicated with the, the figures at the beginning of this talk. Um, people come to this, one of my favorite churches in North Sydney, architecturally speaking, is there in Alfred Street, I think it went up in 1878. Um, oh, 1870, I got the date there. But it was bought by the a Chinese Christian church in eight, 1967, once the local congregation had dwindled so much, and it's remained so, and it pumps today. There are um, services in Mandarin and Cantonese, and it's a really important center of the local Chinese community. And I know, having given talks at the local um, community centre at Crow's Nest that there is a vibrant Chinese community very interested in their history and the history of those who came before them. And I'll finish up by saying that what I intend to do with all this information as I intended to do when I gave my first talk on the Chinese 
community here some years ago at Stanton. Some of you may remember that, in fact, but I've added to the information since then. Um, I'm further down the path of creating a website. I've applied for grant funding from Create New South Wales and got my fingers crossed. Uh, and I hope to work with uh, Jensen Design and Site Suite, who, who are designers of websites and creators of websites, who, who created the um, At Home in North Sydney website, which was really successful, won a, a National Trust Award, 2015 or 16. And we're going to aim one way or another to get that up. So much of the information you will see today will be up, searchable, discoverable for everyone across the world, uh, as, as well as locally. And of course, just further going through the archives, every time I go through there and something leaps out at me, I write it down and add it to. Good thing about a website as opposed to a book is that you can always add more information. Once a book's out, it's out, um, but we can do that. And so I'm gonna just keep asking who, how, when, and why, and invite input from um, the community. So there may be people out there listening today who can help out. Maybe I've got some things wrong and you can correct me, or maybe you can add to the information. And certainly the website will be inviting um, people to do so. So I hope I hope that was interesting and thanks very much.